Welcome into the Otson Audibles podcast. Matt Prem, Eric Scopel, Jared Mack. We are all three on a podcast for the first time in probably three or four weeks. Uh, <laughs> it's been a while. Um, we are breaking out with the uh, the mailbag. We got a lot to discuss, a lot to cover, uh, a lot of good questions. And I'm certain it's around football based off of recent news. It's an off football show. Um, Jared, I'm sure would love to see some baseball questions. Maybe we can get that in here soon. But this is football all day. Maybe one day. Yeah, maybe one day. We can one can hope. Um, we got some recruiting to break down. Um, and then a couple things about this year's team. And then the last one I think is kind of a fun one. It's kind of a big picture conference question we can get into. But the first one from at B underscore Fotef one is Oregon's success this season solely based on how well Bo Nix plays. Hashtag Ots and Audibles. I never want to say a season comes down entirely to one player, but, and I'm not saying that, but to be clear, but we, we but you have to acknowledge like the quarterback position, there's like a pretty direct correlation from a success perspective. Um, if you look at Oregon's best years um, over the last decade or so, like, you know, they had Marcus Mariota, they had Justin Herbert, Darren Thomas, probably a little bit, one of those guys who's underappreciated for his involvement in getting Oregon to a national championship. I know they had great skill guys around him, but, he did a great job as kind of the point man. And so when Oregon has been at its best, they've had really good quarterback play. So if we're, I think if we're talking about the season as success under the, I guess, expectation that it's like winning conference championship, contending to play in some sort of New Year's bowl game, then yeah, Bo Nix needs to be, and we should also say Bo Nix or whoever wins the job. I think we all think right now coming out of spring that it will be Nix, but yeah. Whoever's the quarterback needs to be really at the top of their game for Oregon to, to make a push. And, you know, we saw last year with, I think you would assess Anthony Brown as probably average to maybe, I don't know, slightly above average, but certainly not good to great. And Oregon was almost able to win the conference. And maybe you'd argue without some distractions should have, and would have in, in that case made it a New Year six bowl. So that would have been an outlier season. But you look at the way Oregon has had success traditionally, and it's almost always not been despite poor quarterback play. So I will say for Oregon to reach the expectations that currently are in place for each season, which is win the division, win the conference, contend for, I know we want to say college football playoff, but to me that's sometimes unrealistic, but like a New Year's Six game, you need Knicks to play at a really high level. And I don't think I'm really, we're not like reinventing the wheel with that take. This is my first take coming off of a vacation. So um, go me. Hopefully this makes sense. But like, I, I think obviously to, to have a, a really, really high end season, you need good quarterback play. Um, but I, I don't think you can say an entire season depends on the play of quarterback because in part, like last season, you had middling quarterback play, almost made a run. And, and I'd also point like Anthony Brown was at fault in some of those losses, definitely was in a couple of them in particular. But I'd also say like Oregon was injuries at linebacker away, issues at receiver away. Um, issues at offensive line uh, at times with kind of the inconsistency there away as well. So a, a lot of factors need to break right for a team or a season to be really successful. I, I think, I mean, you put it pretty well. Um, I, I, how many times in the NFL and in college football has a team won either the Super Bowl or the national championship with average quarterback play? Doesn't, doesn't happen. I mean, I think the most famous one in the NFL is Trent Dilfer with, with the Ravens. Um, but I really can't think of anybody after that. And that was what early two thousands. Then that happened in the NFL um, and college. You, you've got to have good quarterback play. It does not mean you have to have the best quarterback in college football, or even maybe a top five quarterback in college football, because I think, Top five to top 10 is, you know, the gap there isn't really wide. But you got to have a good guy. The, the guy's got to be a playmaker. He's got to have a, at least a couple games where he wins you the, the, the game because he's so good. Uh, you know, th there's going to be games where he's not good and the defense rises up and wins you that game. And then there's going to be the, 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 the opposite where you got to have the quarterback who can be the gunslinger and, and will your team to a win. And so, like you said, Eric, you don't want to just put it all on Bo Nix, but you know, they can win eight, nine games with an average quarterback. But if they want to win the Pac-12, they want to get to a New Year's Six Bowl game, 
whoever wins the job has to be above average. I mean, they've got to be good. They don't have to be elite, but they got to be good. Yeah, I mean, quarterback is the most important position maybe in all of professional sports. It, it's the biggest difference maker in an outcome between a win or a loss. Um, Matt, I'd like to throw in the Denver Broncos with Peyton Manning as their quarterback Ooh. against the Carolina Panthers. That was Peyton Manning. Yeah, he wasn't very year. good that year. Terrible. Um, but anyways, for whoever wins the job for Oregon, yeah, the difference between a New Year's Six game and maybe a conference championship and maybe – seven wins in a season is how consistent their quarterback play is. Um, last year, Oregon's offensive line, once those consistencies happen, once they stopped rotating more or less, once they moved TJ Bass to left tackle, that gave them all the ability on the ground to go and run and win themselves a football game and kind of take the ball out of Anthony Brown's hands and say, look, we're going to run first, pass next. Um, and that might happen this year if Phoenix is inconsistent or if Ty Thompson or whoever wins the job is inconsistent um, or it might not. And maybe whoever wins the job is actually quite good. Maybe they are one of the better quarterbacks in the Pac-12. Um, I think that's the that's going to be the main difference maker. Uh, if you score more points than the other team, you win. Fun fact. Um, and I, I feel pretty confident in saying that Oregon's defense should be should be good this season, you know, barring injuries. And I'm, I don't think they'll ever come close to having a season like last year with injuries because that was a statistical anomaly compared to what it's always been. And, but at the end of the day, yeah, Bo Nix or the quarterback who wins the job, um, it doesn't necessarily all fall squarely on their shoulders, um, but a large chunk of it does because they're the quarterback. They are the difference maker in between a win and a loss more often than not. I'll submit Stetson Bennett from Georgia as a, I'm not saying he was bad or anything, but that's not an elite level quarterback and Georgia just won a championship. And so, I mean, I think maybe the, as you said, I mean, if you have an elite defense, that, that was the issue. That was what helped Peyton Manning play pretty yep. poorly, but they won a championship. Like Dilfer, uh, um, I think back to like Kerry Collins with the Ravens, I think won one. Do we put, do we put maybe one of the Eli Manning Super Bowls on there? No, we don't because I mean, the Patriots just, <laughs> anti-boston podcast um no i i uh I, I i i think the point we're all making is like if we're oregon to really play at a high level nicks has to play at a pretty darn high level and if he doesn't it's more than likely they'll drop some games that, that you probably don't expect them to and i think the schedules i know we haven't done like too many predictions like the schedule's pretty favorable if i'm honest like if you look at it um then oregon will have a chance to win a lot of games this year if if everything breaks the right way, and Knicks will go, certainly go, uh, I think, a big part of, of kind of determining that. All right. Second one from at Kevin Marks. Do the recent wide receiver transfers make us more vulnerable to younger wide receivers transferring? Um, so th those would be Chase Coda and Caleb Chapman, the two CC grad transfer receivers. Um I mean, technically, maybe a little bit. Like, I, I mean, we'll, we'll, I know we're gonna. We've already talked about Chapman on a previous podcast. Like, but I look at that as a total roll of the dice thing. Where this guy, if not for injury, could have been really successful at AM. And you're just kind of hoping in one of his two years at Oregon, he stays healthy. And if he does, he can be really productive. But there's also a possibility injuries continue to be a problem, or he's not quite as explosive as he was a couple of years ago when he looked like a potential breakout guy for the Aggies. And so, like, I don't know if he scares away the young guys. And Coda's a one and done, so I don't think he's scaring away anyone on the roster currently. Not anybody that has like big aspirations. I mean, maybe a guy who's really far down the depth chart. I don't even want to pick names because I think that's sort of dangerous sometimes. But to suggest someone's going to transfer, but like maybe, maybe there's a younger guy who looks up and goes, "Okay, I was hoping to be receiver." realistically six or seven and now i'm mm -hmm. receiver seven or eight and that can be the difference between playing i don't know 100 snaps a season and playing 30 and that forces a transfer but i i don't think here's what i would say i don't think it's going to cause any of the the players that people have really high expectations to transfer like i don't think dante thornton or troy franklin or kyler casper or uh isaiah bravard chris hudson or seven mcgee these guys that are like People, some of those guys are in the spring and were standouts. Casper's uh, a guy we're projecting down the line who people are really high on. I don't think it forces any of those guys to leave. I mean, these aren't players that are going to be here for three to four years. These are guys that are, in Coda's case, one year, and Chapman's case, 
too. And again, with Chapman, I, I think I think that's to me. I, I think that's a total gamble on Oregon's staff, not necessarily in a bad way, but of hey, if if he's able to kind of reach where he was, you know, in 2020 when he had that breakout game against Florida before he tore his ACL, this is a guy who can be pretty pretty spectacular and can help. But there's also a chance he doesn't get there, and he's just kind of with the team and along for the ride. Mm-hmm. I think in today's day and age, players are going to transfer regardless of upperclassmen coming into the program or not. I That's mean, good point. we've we've seen across football, we've seen across college sports that starters that are freshmen or sophomores, two-year starters, just up and leave for various reasons. So I, I think if you're a coach – at the collegiate level and the era of the NCAA transfer portal, you almost have to, have to operate in a 12 month window, maybe an 18 month window of, Hey, these are the guys we've got this season uh, in six months, eight months. We'll regroup. We'll see where we're at in terms of who, who wants to stay, who wants to leave. And we'll cycle through the, again, trying to reload the roster to fill the gaps that that will be created because whether Chapman joins the program or Oregon goes out, maybe they get Malik Benson, the the junior college receiver in the 2023 class. And, you know, maybe a, a younger player decides to leave after this upcoming season. It, it could happen regardless of who Oregon brings in. It could happen because Oregon signs four really good high school guys that, that show up and are better than they are. And so I don't think it will. Um, I think the transfers would happen anyways. Um, especially guys who maybe graduate college and can grad transfer and save that waiver to, to be eligible right away. Um, if that next destination doesn't work out, um, but it, it's going to happen. I'm not too worried about it. You, you, you got to build the roster best, the best you can for the, for the upcoming season. And then after that reflect and do it again. Yeah, I agree with Matt. It's just going to happen whether anybody likes it or not. Um, it's not our decisions. It's certainly only the players' decisions to transfer or not transfer. Um, I think, yeah, for certain position groups, it will be impacted if they keep continue to bring people in. Um, but like Eric mentioned, Cotto is only a one, he's a one and done. Uh, Chapman is a two and done, but that it's a huge, not a huge risk, but it's a risk because of his injury history. Um, you know, torn ACL and this is, 90% of 2020 and then misses 70% of 2021. And then an injury holds him out for spring camp this year. It's not a great past in terms of injury. Um, but to answer the question of will the transfers make him, uh, Oregon more vulnerable to wide receiver transfers from the room? No, hundred percent not. Um, it's going to happen. Like Matt said, um, this group is still incredibly young. Um, they still understand that, uh, there's there are people in front of them, but they are all pretty darn talented. You look at the room where you have like a four star like Isaiah Bravard, who may be a little for, further down on the depth chart, but he's still old, uber talented. He's a specific body type that I don't think Oregon really has that he can play his way into the rotation. And barring an injury or two, those guys are literally just a couple of seconds away from being thrown up into the depth chart because of an injury. And so with that, I mean, this is why Oregon needed to go out and get a couple of transfer portal wide receivers. Um, They probably got more than anticipated, but I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing considering that a lot of it is um, on a lot of the wide receiver pressures on players who haven't performed significantly, except for Chris Hudson, more or less. Um, I mean, Troy Franklin and Dante Dorman were, were fine last year, but they didn't show that they could be a one or a two. So the more depth, the better. Uh, Chapman is healthy. That's a that's a great gamble. Um, but it's I don't. It's not going to impact somebody on their position of transferring. If it's they were just thinking about transferring before when they had a clear path to get in, then they'll probably be thinking more about it now. Yeah, I guess just how I'd leave it is. At a certain point, it's about development. And if a kid is going to leave, maybe it's because they – I mean, you know, like a high four-star kid who doesn't develop and uh, down the line, maybe a player who's younger passes him on the depth chart. That seems more likely to force a kid to take a peek around and, and maybe enter the portal than a couple of guys like 
And I, I really like Chase Coda. I really like the upside of what I've seen from Caleb Chapman. I want to be clear. I think both those guys could contribute, but I mm-hmm. don't. If, that, if that's scaring you off, that might speak more to your personal development and what you're worried about down the line. Then, because it's, it's, it shouldn't be just about one season, at least not from my perspective. You got to think big picture, especially when you have three to four years of eligibility remaining. Not those to, are going to be other impact. Not, not to also be negative towards those two guys, but neither of them have just these insane careers at their previous stops. Yeah. So like if a guy, if two guys that combine to have less than 1500 yards receiving in four years of college athletics scares you uh, to the point where you transfer out deep down if I'm the Oregon coaches, you're probably like that guy wasn't going to make it here anyways, because he's, a, he's afraid to compete. It's a good point too. Yeah. It's not, it's not even like, it's like about a thousand yards combined, probably not even 15. Yeah. I was trying to like, I, I can't, I didn't have the, the stats in front of me and I couldn't remember exactly. So I was just overestimating, but still to that point, even a thousand, I mean, that, if that scares you away, that says more about your, your desire to compete than the additions of these two guys. All right, we're going to do a recruiting question from at QuackAttack74. What do you all think the chances are of Dan Lanning, sorry, of the Dan Lanning-led Ducks breaking the recruiting record that Cristobal set a few years ago? Hashtag Ots and Audibles. Cristobal, I mean, really elevated Oregon recruiting. There's no doubt about it. Um, they reached their peak in 2021 with the seven, number seven ranked class nationally. No five stars from the composite perspective. Kingsley Sumatia was a, was a five star in the two four seven rankings but it is represented differently on his on the commitment profile but uh seven is probably attainable at some point but like it has to break right and i also think we have to acknowledge like i think my time yeah my timeline's right the nil stuff wasn't in play in 2021 and so the landscape from which dan landing is recruiting I know it's only been a couple of years is, is slightly different even than it was with Cristobal here. And that may work in Oregon's favor. It may not, I don't know, but you have to like acknowledge that the kind of like the, the rules from which you're playing have kind of shifted a little bit. And so you can't, re- I mean, you can compare them. Obviously I'm not saying you can't compare recruiting rankings only a couple of years apart, but like you have to at least have that kind of stipulation understanding that things have changed a little bit. But with that said, like I, I think they could have a class that gets in that range. It doesn't feel out of the realm of possibility. We had Greg Biggins on the show um, a couple weeks ago, and he was saying the expectation feels like it should be top 10 classes. And if that, that, I don't think that precludes them getting the sixth ranked class one year or the fifth ranked class one year. You know, I'm not predicting it. I don't know if it'll be 23. I don't know when it'll happen. Um, but yeah, I think it's possible. Uh, what, are, what are the chances is, I guess, how the question is framed. Uh I don't. I have no idea how to like really assess that. I'm not. I'm not a mathematician. Maybe there's some sort of like uh, some sort of equation I could write. But I'm guessing like I don't know. Maybe like I'll say above fifty percent chance that happens during his time here. I think it will happen. Um, I I think you look at look at Oregon football in the last six or seven years when Chip Kelly, Mark Helfrich year was going on. They, they were recruiting um, selectively. They weren't offering a ton of guys. They weren't ultra aggressive on the trail. They had success. They had a top 10 class. Taggart obviously um, didn't finish his class, but at a time, Scout, which is now part of 24-7 Sports, had Oregon's class number one in the country. Oregon was like two or three for 24 seven sports at the time when they were two separate. Um, Mario has Oregon at the all time high and different, different coaches, different styles, different philosophies, different ways they operate. And they've all had different levels of success. And I think that almost goes to the question now where if you put forth the effort into recruiting at Oregon, it doesn't really matter who the head coach is. As long as you put forth the effort, Oregon's brand is big enough now where top 10 is easily attainable. Um, Maybe not every season, but top 15 is expected. And every other cycle, every third year, maybe you're, you're pushing for that top five and six or seven or eight is where you land. Maybe you get into that five. So I I think it's going to happen, especially now too, with 
the NCAA allowing schools to sign over 25 players in one class. Um, we, we could see that happen in 2024 if there's a mass exodus of guys going pro, guys graduating, guys transferring. We could see Dan Landing quickly turn over this roster with 30 guys. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but that that could also factor in. I think it'll happen as well, um, but – I don't want to dismiss how difficult it's going to be. Um, not only do you have all the SEC powerhouses and you know Alabama, Georgia, and Texas A&M now, uh, there's LSU still lurks. You still have Ohio State, Michigan. Every once in a while, could put together a good recruiting class depending on who's in their state. Um, and then you have to go toe to toe with USC. And now, the last couple of years, Oregon has battled with USC. It hasn't always gone the Trojans' favor. It seems like Oregon has dominated that matchup. Um, you know, just look at like the 2019 class with Thibodeau and Michael Wright and Mace Funa. Those are all, you know, wins over USC. I don't know how many more of those Oregon's gonna get in terms over Lincoln Riley. I think they'll they'll get they'll get some, don't get me wrong, but it won't be like the pure and kind of utter domination it was with Mario at the helm compared to Clay Helton. Um so that's, that's limited. Uh, it's just going to be difficult. But as you can see from the last recruiting class and getting Kyler Casper and Josh Connerly Jr. at the buzzer, um, this this staff can, can recruit. <laughs> they can recruit at a very high level. Um, and I think they're only going to get better. Um, you look at, you know, like Carlos Lachlan, the running back coach. Um, he's kind of come out of nowhere and just become an – an excellent people's person and a lead recruiter of a lot of, a lot of guys, um, you know, helping out getting Jordan James and helping out and getting multiple running back recruits at this time and, and bringing in Noah Whittington as well. Um, the, the staff as a whole, I think, can get to that point where they can compete for a top 10, a top five class. Um, number seven overall for that 21, 21 class is really impressive. Um, I think that's going to be the target line to get above that is, is it's just going to be hard. And there's, but I do think that they managed to get above it. Um, I, I don't know if it'll be in the next couple of years, but it always depends on how long Dan Lanning will stick around. Um, it'll take some time, but I, I do think at one point they can achieve that. If, if the West coast has, you know, like a really good recruiting class, if California is stacked, Arizona is stacked. If, if Washington continues to have these cycles with multiple five stars, um, if, if Oregon, if the state of Oregon has a couple four stars, um, I think there's, there's better chances for, for Oregon to attack something like that. All right, let's, we're halfway through the mailbag. Let's take a quick break for some commercials. We come back, we'll, uh, empty out the mailbag. All right. Welcome back to the Autzen Audible's podcast. Uh, three questions in, two more to go on this edition of the mailbag. All right. B a duck ninety three asks, when will there be a wave of twenty three commitment dropping, and who will be the top five recruits in the class of twenty three? Hashtag Ottsonables. This is a really challenging one to answer. Um, <laughs> well, aren't we already in that wave right now? I, mean- I was just, I was going to say, I think we've kind of started to enter it actually a little bit here um, over the last couple of weeks. Um, I mean, do we want to, is that the answer, Matt? Is that as simple as like, we're kind of in the heat of it? I mean, this is, by the way, we should know like May to June, or really from the end of the spring game through like the middle of June is typically kind of the time where you see a lot of work being done from recruiting in terms of getting commitments. Mm-hmm. I think we are kind of in the middle of it. I think um, we are. I mean, Dickey committed on the 2nd of May. And then 11 days later, Dante Dowdell committed to Oregon um, on the 13th. And then Ashton Cozart most recently committed on the 22nd. That doesn't factor in the three specialist transfers that they added, two of which had uh, D1 experience at their previous stops to the 2022 roster. That also does not factor in the Caleb Chapman addition to this roster, which happened last week. So we're at seven commitments in the month of May, and it's still not over. Um, granted, that's 2022 and 2023, but I, th- I think we're in that wave right now. Um, we're going to see recruits continue to come through Oregon 
for unofficial and official visits. And it's sounding like there's going to be a couple camps in June, a really big recruiting weekend in the end of June. So this could this could be like a not necessarily a slow burn, but it, it could be something that trails out for six or eight weeks in terms of verbal commitments. You know, one or one or two a week. Can we can we refer? Okay, let's ask the second part then, or try our best. I think that's a really hard question. The top five recruits in the class. Yeah. Maybe, let's reframe it as. Are we thinking of the guys currently committed? How many of those guys end up being a top, you know, top part of that top five in this class? Like Cole Martin is 91st in the country. You got Jerry and Dickey here, who's um, 128th. But as, as Greg Biggins noted, I think we think he might be kind of pretty underrated right now, and that that ranking could change. Uh, Ashton Cozart, the most recent, is right on his heels at 164. Like those three guys, does it feel realistic that how many of those guys, Matt, are you, I know it's, this is like really difficult to do. And we're really talking a lot of hypotheticals here because the class is like a quarter of the way at probably full. But does it feel like those guys may be in that top five, if you were to predict right now? I think Dickie will be. Um, what happens with Cole Martin, that's going to be tough. I mean, he's top 100. So you have to factor that into maybe the back end of that top five. Um, but Oregon is in a, just an amazing position for multiple five-star recruits, two oh, offensive yeah. linemen or two offensive tackles, Caden Proctor and Samson Okanola. Um, Okanola was on campus this past weekend. Proctor has been here before. Those are five-star offensive linemen. And it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest if Oregon lands one of them. Spencer Fano, another four-star offensive tackle, was also on campus this past weekend. Tight, tight end, you know, they, they've got some guys that are really close. You know, Riley Williams is really close to Oregon. In-state kid, top 100 player. So I I feel like Dickey gets there. Cole Martin, that one is hard because I, I just feel like they're going to they're gonna land multiple top 100 guys. And I'm banking on Dickey. You know, he's like in the 60s for us right now for 24-7 sports. Um, I'm banking on him doing what Biggins said and approaching five-star status. Not getting there, but he'll at least be in the discussion. That means he's going to be in the 30 to 40 range. And I just I just think they're going to land four or five other guys that are top 100 players, which pushes Cole Martin into that, you know, how much does he improve as well? I think if you're pushing Cole Martin out at the end of the year of your top five, I think that's a pretty good recruiting cycle yeah. because he's, you know, he's a, he's a top 100 guy. And, you know, those don't, obviously those don't come around as often as, as you'd like for a, an Oregon class, but the last couple of years they have. And Cole Martin, you know, son of coach Demetrius Martin, quarterback coach, um, Greg Biggins had a lot of nice words to say about him as well. Um, but yeah, I, I I think Matt's Matt's on par here with with the amount of players inside the top 100 that they're interested in, that probably the amount that they do end up signing. Um, the jury on Dickey comments from Biggins. I don't know if we've all like kind of really talked about this, um, other than maybe just in our Slack channel. Um, like I've been saying for I don't know probably months at this point, Dickey was the most impressive performer at Oregon's last Saturday Night Live. I think that was last summer. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, yeah, I just, it was really interesting to hear from Biggins that like, you know, he, he could be somebody who maybe creeps in on that five-star status by the end of his high school football season. Um, he's every bit of 6'2", like 2'10 already, super athletic, high points the ball really well. Um, just really interested to see where he gets along. And so he could easily be in that top five, if not like a top three by the end of the year. Jared, is, I know you use this term. I can't remember who it was about, but you, you have a football crush on Jerry and Dickey. Is that is that how you're feeling? Now, who was that about? Like? A football crush? I don't know. Yeah, it was I mean, it was Kai for a long time, but <laughs> I thought it was seven. <laughs> was it? Was that what it was? Seven? I can't. It might have been. Seven. Yeah. You, but, you, you yeah, use the term. I, I think, I, but it seems like it applies based upon. And I, I'll probably say I also have a football crush on Jordan Dickey. I think that kid's going to be really good, and that's why if you're talking about top I, I five, had, at the 2019 SNL, I had a football crush on Dante Thornton because he was just an animal, and he was so much. He was the best wide receiver there by far, and there were a lot of good wide receivers there. 
And it felt the same way watching Dickey, you know, two years later, where it's like, whoever Oregon gets from this camp, I hope it's that guy is going to make the most impact on the team if they do get him. So it's 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 exciting to have guys like that in the class. And we just did a podcast on Monday too about Ashton Kozer, another player we're we're all high on. I I, I think the receiver position, another I, we talked about it, but another kind of little round of applause for Junior Adams who came over mm-hmm. from Washington. I think the Huskies were frustrated with player development and the recruiting there was pretty solid. Recruiting's been excellent so far at Oregon. If you talk about what he's done, getting Casper, what he's done now with Cozart, with what he's done with Dickey, um, probably playing a role in, in in Coda. Some of the de- what we thought was development with a guy like I think Seven McGee um, improving the way he did and fitting into that role. Like I know we're now talking not even re- remotely about what the question was, but like seems like Junior Adams. You mentioned Carlos Lachlan as somebody who's really impressed. I think Adams' name was one of those names that was like Auckland, kind of like you were, I don't know. There's kind of some mixed messages about what this is, maybe a little uncertainty. So far, like Adams as a recruiter has been excellent. And the early indications from spring camp or his, his development as a coach has been pretty darn good too. All right, we're going to wrap it up here with a question from at Prince Puddles. Oregon, Utah, and if you want to believe the hype, USC will be the top teams in the conference. What other dark horse teams could emerge and take the next step as programs to start competing for Pac-12 titles? and strengthen the conference next year. Hashtag odds and audibles. Um, conference badly needs a fourth team, yeah. fifth team, a sixth team to be somewhat relevant. Um, you know, you think about when the conference was really, I mean, when Oregon was really at the top and competing, you know, four big bowl games and was a big national, and I'm not saying that's completely dissipated, but, you know, at the height of the mid-2010s, Like Stanford was really, really good. And then there was a couple of years where Washington at the tail end there started becoming really good. And obviously uh, USC was competitive at times there. Utah took a step. Like I feel like there needs to be, I I think there needs to be a fourth or fifth team. It's kind of hard though, looking around the conference and really pinpointing it. Um, I'll pick, I, I don't know if we want this to be the exercise, but I've got a team in the North and a team in the South that I think could be, but I'm not totally sold like on either of them. I think in the North, it's really hard, man. Like I, it's not, I'm not all that impressed with really the directions of most of these programs. Um, I'll throw out Washington State for the short term because I do think they've got some things in place. Like last year's team wasn't terrible. Um, Cameron Ward was one of the best players at the FCS level. He comes over with his offensive coordinator. Um, Maybe maybe they're the team in the division to challenge Oregon. I think Oregon State would probably be the other team I would point to, but I don't know if either of those teams are legit. Pac-12 championships going to compete contend for really special seasons next year or even in a couple of years. And in the South, like Arizona State crossed them off. Um, Colorado crossed them off. Arizona feels like they're ascending, but to expect them to go from one win to like <laughs> seven or eight feels like a huge leap. Um, UCLA, maybe, I guess probably UCLA is where I would land in the South. If I had to pick a second, a third team besides Utah and USC. And, and frankly, like, I think I look at this and you guys can tell me if you disagree. I think the North is maybe pretty inferior to the South this year. And that's kind of new territory, um, from a division perspective where the Pacto of North for a long time has really been kind of carrying the conference. And I look at this and go, I think Oregon's going to be really good. And I, I really it's hard to pinpoint who like two and three are going to be. I didn't mention Washington. That's probably slightly because of the rivalry, but I think you have legit question marks there with the way their team has kind of played out this off season with some transfers and poor recruiting classes and they have a new staff. And I don't know, I'm not sure I'm really buying Washington as being a team that's going to go from four wins to nine wins in year one without a ton of improvements on the roster, because I don't think that's there. Even though I think the coaching kids are better. Um, I had two names and ironically enough, Eric, one was from the north and one was from the south. Or formerly the north and the south. We need to oh, get used sorry, to saying sorry. that. Yes, no more divisions please. in the Pac-12 conference. My fault. Um, that, by the way, that happened when I was on vacation. On, you can't, you can't <laughs> me for that. I just I didn't even. Uh, the first one is California. I think. Hmm. I, I think last year, maybe even the year before that wasn't really true to who they were. They got hit by injuries pretty hard. They had COVID restrictions that felt a little unfair that made them be without multiple guys, you know, for multiple games. Um, I I think this is going to be a bounce back year. And we're talking 
sleeper teams. So I don't think the expectation for Cal is to come out in 2022 and, and win nine games. But I think eight is a very real possibility for them and would be what the league needs, a solid fourth team. Um, but they've added a bunch of guys from the transfer portal. Um, and ironically enough, guys from the Pac-12, uh, they've added player from UCLA, ASU, Utah, Washington. And then they've also gone outside the conference with an offensive tackle from Montana State and then a quarterback, Jake Plummer, or Jack Plummer, um, from Purdue, I think could help with their issues at quarterback. It's always been quarterback for Cal. Like, they've always had a good defense and solid offensive pieces around the quarterback, but quarterback stinks. Um, and then the other one is UCLA. Um, they're another school who has cleaned up in the transfer portal. Um, 12 guys. Chip Kelly has been crazy with the portal. Adding 12 players, and a lot of them are from Power 5 schools. Some of them are from Pac-12 programs. They've got two Oregon guys, Jalen Jeffers and Jalen Davies. Um, they've added uh, Latu from Washington. Uh, and Jake Bobo, a receiver from Duke, is really good. Um Aziz Hearn from Wyoming is solid. Um, they've they've really beefed up their their ranks, and then I, I think their recruiting class was also a lot better than it, what it's been the last couple of years at UCLA. And so I, I'm I'm banking on the fact that a lot of guys are back from UCLA. Their quarterback is back. They're coming off a year of success, and they've hit the portal really hard. They, they might be a team to, to get to eight or maybe even nine wins. I think for me in this exercise, the one easy answer was UCLA. For Agreed. most of the outlines that Matt just gave out, uh, you know, they added they added good players to the portal. Uh, their recruiting class was better than average. Uh, they're coming off a year of success, finally, under Chip Kelly. Um, my lone problem with them is they still have DTR. And mm -hmm. that – was their Achilles heel, but also their shining star, as it has been for the last three years. Um, Chip has also only had one successful season yeah. at UCLA. Um, they lost some defensive guys. Uh, I think that could be – because their, their defense was pretty darn good last year. I think that was a surprise. Um, but can they replicate that performance? I'm not quite sure. Um uh, so I think they're my they're they're the easy pick at least in the in the in the South quote unquote um, because like Eric went through Arizona no Colorado no um, Arizona State no the North North quote unquote um, that's difficult because I don't know it might be Oregon State you know they went undefeated at home last year. They've got a solid team. They've got most of their most of their important guys returning. I know they don't have um, – I can't remember his name. The defensive end who's not returning. Rashad, is that his name? Hamakla Rashad, yeah. Yeah, and um, that's going to be a big loss for them. Um, but I don't know. Jonathan Smith just seems like he's got something going there. They've hit the transfer portal hard for the last couple of years. Maybe that's the, the only other one. In the conference. He's he's pretty good. He just doesn't he doesn't have consistent quarterback play. And maybe they found something towards the end of the year. Maybe it's going to be a new name like it has been for the last couple of years. Um, it, the North is difficult because I don't I, I like what Washington has going on in terms of their coaching staff and the kind of players that they're bringing in. But like Eric mentioned, their their roster hasn't really brought in any talent. They've kind of lost some. Um, their, their recruiting woes have continued even after Jimmy Lake has gone. Um, Washington State, I feel like, is still a huge question mark. I'm not exactly sure if they're going, if like the, if the offense is going to come back like it has been. Um, it's difficult. So I, I think my only, my only like team I'd bet on in this instance would be UCLA. Um, and then I, I guess I'd go Oregon State as my second team. I think UCLA is set up for either an ultimate tease or they're going to be really good because this is their schedule. They open at home against Bowling Green, Alabama State, and South Alabama the first three weeks out of the year. And then their first conference game is a road game, but it's at Colorado. 
and it's in September. So they're not going to have to deal with the weather elements. Colorado isn't going to be a good team. They play a Friday night game at home against Washington for their fifth game. So four out of their first five games are at home. Three of them are against cream puffs. And two of them are going to be against teams who will be picked in the lower half of the conference um, in Colorado and Washington. They have a stretch where they've got to play Utah at Oregon after a bye week. And then they get, then they get Stanford at home. That's going to be tough, a three-week stretch right there. And then they close out with four games, two on the road, two at home, at ASU, Arizona, USC, at Cal. I mean, you go two and two in those ones, you open up five and oh on the season. That's seven wins right there. And you, you got to tell me you got to be able to find – two wins or one win between Wash uh, between Utah, Oregon, and Stanford to get the eight. That's very doable. And, and like I said, they could be a tease where they're five and oh and maybe like a top ten or a top fifteen team in the country because they haven't played anybody up yeah. until the Utah game. Kind of I mean it, they played LSU last year and that's why they were ranked really high, but that's sort of what happened last year. They peaked really early and then they kind yeah. of fell apart. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I think you. I think UCLA is the easiest pick from to join this group, and uh, honestly, it's kind of hard to come up. We we all had a, another team, and I'll use the quotations like Jared has been using Pac-12 North team that we kind of threw in the discussion. None of us picked Washington. I think that speaks to things other than football, probably a little bit, just a little bit of the rivalry, but but also because I'm not optimistic about where they're headed right away. But like, yeah, I mean, Cal, Washington State, Oregon State, maybe. I don't know. I don't know who's. Again, the biggest rival for Oregon this year. I think it's a in the in the quote unquote division that no longer exists. I I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty open up there, and probably not. A, I mean, I that's where I it, we mentioned earlier. You look at the schedule for Oregon. Like it's not, it's not that scary at least from an expectation of what we think these teams are today. And I'm sure we'll be changing our tune by the time we get to some of these games in October and November, and we see how some of these teams have developed. But um, Jared's got ghosts at his apartment. Yeah, but uh, strange. But uh, <laughs> but I, I, I continue to be like, there just aren't a lot of scary teams in the conference. And I think that's the point that the question is trying to ask of like for Oregon or Utah or USC, for any of those teams to be like legitimate contenders for a playoff berth, you do need a fourth or fifth team to step up. I think it's pretty easy to identify UCLA as the quote unquote fourth. It's hard to get to who could be the fifth or sixth best team. Yeah. right? I've got a question for you guys. Do you – believe the usc hype no as prince puddles has put into the fifth question matt a resounding no do not they they say different head coach same issue for the last like four coaches they have all the skill talent in the world but they are not good up front they have no depth they don't i mean how many nfl players do they have on either side of the football one two I mean, to, to be on the lines. Yeah. Like to, to, to be a a conference contender winner, to be a college football playoff team, you need like two NFL dudes on both sides of the ball, like to, to, to be at that level consistently. Um, Maybe not in the same draft, but they continue to load up on receivers. They continue to load up on cornerbacks. I will argue that, Their receivers are probably going to be the best, if not top five in the country. Um, They will have good quarterback play, but it doesn't matter how good your quarterback is if you can't protect him and you can't give him time to get to the receivers or you can't give the receivers time to get open. And so when I see like the Utah USC betting lines with, you know, USC favorite, it's like, I want to bet that so hard because I'm at the point with USC where I won't believe it until they actually show it on the field. I think if your question, if, if believe the hype, I think Oregon, Utah, and USC are the three best teams in the conference. It's probably hard for me to be convinced otherwise. I don't know if I'm sold USC will be one of the conference championship teams. Yeah. I'm not sure mm-hmm. I can get there. Um, I think the upside of them is pretty scary if they can. I mean, I don't disagree with Matt in terms of there are pretty clear weaknesses there. 
the ceiling could be really high though with just if, with what they could do offensively. But there are going to be games where some of the I mean I think and that's where Utah becomes potentially a really interesting matchup for USC. Now we're getting pretty far down the down the rabbit hole, I guess. But like a, an Oregon, if they end up playing USC in a conference championship, or a Utah who obviously plays USC, like those are going to be games where some of these weaknesses, some of these holes in USC's rosters are really tested based upon the strengths of both of those programs, which has been the last couple of years line play. And we've seen USC really have a hard time competing in those games. I and mean, Oregon has handled USC a couple of times in, in conference championship games or that game down at the Coliseum back in 19. Utah has has pretty actually pretty back and forth games with USC of late, but I, I probably would favor Oregon and Utah over USC right now based upon what we know. But I'm also not going to be stunned again, like if we get into October and November and we look up and go, eh, USC is like actually pretty, pretty scary. So I'd say I'm, I, it, I believe the hype that they should be in this top three group because I just don't think there's a clear team that should be ahead of them. But I don't think they're a top 10, top 12, top 15 team nationally. Or does it feel that way right now? I probably need to go and kind of look more closely at some of the other teams that are in discussion. I kind of I, I believe the hype a good bit, honestly. It feels like a Oklahoma team in the past um, with Lincoln Riley at the helm. It feels like uh, Baker Mayfield's last year where they didn't have the best offensive line. Uh, their defense was mediocre. Uh, but, man, they just put up more points than anybody else. And the only way you could beat them is if you scored 48 points to their 45. Um but that's exactly what Georgia did in the Rose Bowl. And I feel like there are enough teams in this conference to at least potentially contend point for point against them. Um, like, I think, like, Arizona and USC, like, that game is going to be wild. Um, <laughs> Interesting. Because those are two only strictly offensive teams. Um, so I think if, if – or even a team like Utah – who I think would run the ball a lot and kind of milk the clock and hold the ball away from USC in that game. I think those are going to be the strategies. It's literally just like we have to figure out ways to score and we have to figure out ways to stop them Um, because I I think it's, I think it's a reasonable hype. I think they should absolutely be in the top three um, to be a top 10 team in the country. Probably not, especially at this point, Um, but inside the top 15. Yeah. I totally understand why people would put them there. Um, I'd like to see them play a couple games. Um, I know their, their spring game had some cool highlights and stuff like that. Obviously, adding Jordan Addison is uh, really nice for them. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, getting the Blendikoff winner. Um, but, yeah, it comes down to can they protect Caleb Williams um, because that's the thing that worries me the most. Because if Caleb Williams goes down with an injury, then nothing matters. Yeah. Um, they won't they I, I don't think they have a true true backup quarterback like they've had in the years past where it's a four or five star starting and then they have a four and a five star behind them like two or three of them um i can't tell you who usc's backup quarterback is off the top of my head and if williams goes down then they lose the air attack and then the offensive line struggles begin to show i am with eric though like i was very quick to say no to your question jared but i am with eric in agreement that they are the third they are that third team in the conference that's really good. Or not really good, but yeah, above everybody else in the league. I just don't think the Pac-12 has a, has a playoff team in its midst this season. So I, mm. you know, if, if Oregon and Utah or Utah and Oregon are the league's one and two best teams and USC's three, and none of the top two are playoff teams in my eyes – you know, that should tell you where USC's pecking order is. Top 25, but they're not going to be a playoff team, in my eyes. I think Utah could get there. I mean, they could we'll get see. to a playoff team. We'll see. They keep that. They, they lost some guys, too. I mean, they're sure, going to have yeah, some holes. They need a linebacker or two to step up. But they're, and, they return a lot of guys on offense. And kobe has gone at, at receiver. And he was – I mean, he's not the most athletic dude, but – He's just, I don't know. He just Oregon, made plays. Oregon saw how athletic he was. Yeah. I mean, he killed dudes and he's gone. So that's, that's a big replacement too. So I, I think, I think Oregon and Utah have questions. I think Utah maybe has fewer questions, but they're still big enough where I don't feel confident saying that they're going to be a playoff team. I don't think it's unfair to be honest. I mean, I know, I know that 
Utah deserves to be ahead of Oregon in whatever pecking order, in my opinion, based upon mm -hmm. off of last season. I, I just think it. I'm probably with Matt. I just find it. I don't think any of these teams feel like they're. It's been so long since the Pac-12 has had a team in the playoff. It doesn't feel like Utah in 2022 is the team to change that is where I land. And I have a lot of respect right. for what Kyle Whittington is. Whittingham, sorry, has done down there. But I'm not saying they they will be. I'm saying I, I could see it just from what they bring back and how they ended last year. But yeah, I mean it's it's the Pac-12. It's tough for me to say they'll ever get a playoff team again. Oh. <laughs> sad, but it's sad. But I mean, I don't. It, I understand the sentiment, even though I'm probably a little more optimistic with where things are headed the next couple of years. We'll see. I don't know. All right, it's going to do it for us here on the Odds and Audibles podcast. Thank you for submitting your questions. Continue to submit those throughout the week. We'll get to them again next week. And until the next one, you've been listening to the Odds and Audibles podcast. Talk to you later, folks. Peace.